Good afternoon and welcome to Governance Dialogues. My name is Elisa Cole and I'm the Managing Director of Governance Center, which is a think tank and advisory firm that works to advance corporate and other governance priorities worldwide. And for those of you who have had a chance to tune into this uh, program, you would know that we discuss uh, hot topics in the world of corporate governance uh, in conversations with thought leaders, be they board members, regulators, uh, investors, and others. And in fact, in this uh, very episode, I thought to continue with the tradition of discussing issues related to ESG and to stewardship in particular um, in conversations with the representative of the International Corporate Governance Network, which is an umbrella organization that represents almost $55 trillion of assets of investors, be they pension funds, insurance companies, sovereign investors, and others um, that are located around the world. And um, ICGN is an important organization. It's been uh, around since uh, I believe about 25 years and it's lobbying for um, better governance practices uh, through work with its investors or investor members, um, uh, through its global principles on corporate governance, but also on stewardship, which are um, increasingly recognized as a global standard uh, in this area. And on today's episode, I've invited George Dallas, who is the policy director at the ICGN, to join us for a conversation on investor stewardship, and if I may say, activist stewardship by investors, which is something that we're seeing sort of uh, more and more of and more discussions uh, in the financial press around BlackRock, around um, Vanguard, State Street, uh, California Pension Fund and, and many other um, um, pension and, and uh, uh, insurance uh, investors. So George, welcome to this um, uh, program. It's a, such a pleasure to have you join us from, from London. Uh, thanks, Alyssa. That was a wonderful introduction of ICGN. I'm not sure I could have done that better myself. Thank you. Thank you very much. And maybe I should do on, on that, uh, on that uh, note an introduction to you. Of course, I've um, followed your work uh, at the ICGN, but also before. I mean, you're a renowned figure in the world of governance. Um, but for the purposes of our audience, just a few words perhaps on, on the work you do at the ICGN. Um, uh, that some might be already familiar with in terms of the guidance statements, the viewpoints, uh, some of the public comments that ICGN had been um, recently putting out on country-specific priorities. I know that, for example, you've been involved in, in some, some work in Japan recently, but also on thematic sort of areas like uh, big tech, and we'll, we'll get to that in, in a couple of minutes. Um, and of course, uh, your work on governance goes you know, way before, uh, sort of started before you joined the ICGN, you were also a visiting lecturer and member of the steering committee of the Center for Corporate Governance at the CAS Business School. Uh, you've published uh, a number of um, articles and books on, notably on, on governance and, and risk. Um, and I, I know you're also very active in, in your current uh, role in, in sort of um, commenting on issues related to, for example, um, some of the um, um, some of the proposed listing rule changes, and and we'll we'll, we'll talk about that also in a second. But uh, I think to start our conversation, I perhaps would like to first ask you, what are the policy priorities currently for the ICGN in the sort of short and medium term in the world post COVID, uh, and how might those priorities actually be different by region? Sort of, are they? Uh, is there a common denominator in terms of what you're trying to achieve in Japan versus UK versus the US, for example? Sure. Well, again, you've, you've introduced ICGN very well. The only thing I would add on top of that is that we're fundamentally an advocacy body. And there are two main things we advocate. Uh, we started out in 1995 as a body to advocate good corporate governance in companies that institutional investors would invest in. And we are an, a, 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 an investor association. Or we're, we have different types of members, but mostly they're institutional investors. So looking at just to in, improve the governance of the companies that investors invest in. But then the other key dimension, which is also part of our priorities, which I think we'll be discussing, is looking at the role of investors themselves and how they can do what they do responsibly, which we would call stewardship. But it is the what we think is the fiduciary duty of investors to 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 do the right thing ultimately for their clients. So it's really this on these two cornerstones of corporate governance on the one hand, and then stewardship and responsible investment on the other, that we that's the foundation for our work. Um, and we we are a global body, which is a distinctive uh, 
distinctive element of ICGN. We have many of the key investor associations like Council of Institutional Investors or Asian Corporate Governance Association in our membership, but our, our purview is global. And as you suggest, I mean, the, we, we have various thematic issues that we look at, and we also look at, at, re, at issues uh, regionally and globally. Um, you asked about our policy priorities, and, and I would outline five of these. And I think that these pretty much would cut across jurisdictions uh, ge geographically. The first one is basically to try to encourage long-term investment perspectives and sustainable value creation. There's a lot of there's a lot packed into that phrase, uh, particularly the sustainability part, but also the long term dimension, because most of the 56, 54 trillion in, in assets under management that you refer to, the vast majority of that is in uh, some form of pension or retirement savings where the, the, the certainly it's a long term perspective, if not theoretically infinite. Um, so trying to instill that way of thinking in terms of how we look at investing. Uh, breeding second priority is making stewardship successful, making having investors do their job properly, but also working with companies to meet one another halfway and to try to promote the role of the investor as, as the responsible steward on behalf of beneficiaries. Um, the third key priority that we have, and again, this will cut across geographies, is just board effectiveness particularly in, a, in an environment where the boundaries of corporate governance are changing rather substantially. Mm -hmm. There are issues on the horizon now that weren't on there 10 or 15 years ago, and particularly looking at environmental and social issues. And, and, and part, of, part of one of the great challenges that I think we're thinking about and focusing on is the governance of sustainability within companies. And then I'll mention two more, and then I'll uh, and then I'll uh, get to, let you ask me another question. But uh, but the other one, uh, the fourth of the five, is protecting minority shareholder rights, and whether this is dual class shares, which is a big issue, which we may be talking about later, or other types of rights that minority shareholders have to basically exert some degree of influence in the governance process. This is something important to us, and that we want to protect and preserve. And then finally relates to, to information, particularly corporate reporting, both financial reporting in terms of its quality and rigor, but also sustainability reporting, because ultimately we need to try to blend uh, the two together to get a complete picture of companies. So those are, all, those are all thematics that I think will resonate pretty much around the world. And in different, different parts of the world, we'll have different specific issues re relative to trends in ownership structures, whether it's state of market development, shareholder versus stakeholder biases, differing governance models. So there, there can be very uh, different models of governance that we also look at when we do uh, our regulatory engagements with uh, regulators and standard setters. That, that's interesting, and certainly I do. I do. Uh, I would like to come back to a number of uh, points you you raised on, on dual class shares and, and whatnot. But um, one thing that um, that jumps to mind. I mean, again, just bouncing from from recent uh, announcements in the press. For example, we've heard. Um, I think it was yesterday or the day before. There was a, a piece in the Financial Times talking about the new uh, CEO of Norges taking a different approach. Uh, and Norges, of course, is a, one of the largest institutional investors worldwide, if not the largest sort of in terms of uh, ownership of equities worldwide, and basically saying that the new direction will be much more, um, much less following the indices and much more um, sort of stock picking and really much more, I guess, uh, driven by company fundamentals and analysis and more engaged with individual companies. Would you think in your, in your view, is that sort of a trend that you're seeing materialize, uh, let's say, throughout the ICGN membership? Are we sort of seeing um, perhaps some thinking around the, the virtue of this, um, let's call it blind faith index uh, approach? Or is there now more thinking around integrating custom ESG parameters in, into um, investment strategies, which are, at least in my view, not really possible if you're following uh, an index strategy? Yeah, uh, well, I think there's, there's a mixture uh, amongst our membership, there's a mixture in the industry. Um, you know, there are still uh, many prominent firms, uh, prominent asset managers, you know, follow largely passive uh, index-based strategies. 
and then others who prefer more active forms of ownership and both have their reasons and rationales. Mm -hmm. I, I think that, you know, well, but the one thing that you, 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 know, the, you, you would argue that I guess a passive strategy might have their hands tied to the extent that if you are tied to an index, there's in terms of the buy sell decision, there's limited influence that you have. You're either in the index or you're not. But I think a lot of the leading uh, passive uh, fund uh, asset managers, and BlackRock is a good example, Vanguard's another, will we'll also have their, their stewardship teams that will still be looking at engaging with companies. Because uh, if you have to have it in your portfolio, you at least not need to try to engage it and in, in to try to use whatever ownership rights you have, whether it's voting rights or just the influence that you have as a, as a significant owner to be able to put your case forward mm -hmm. to the company. So, you know, it's, um, I, I think uh, ESG investing or taking environmental and social issues into consideration, it's, it's relevant for both active as well as passive investing. Uh, in, the active, in the active investing part, it can help to influence, as you're suggesting, buy, sell, hold decisions or valuation decisions. Do I want this company in the portfolio or don't I? And, and, and ESG can and will increasingly contribute to that discussion in terms of just investment decision making for passive funds where those decisions are basically again dictated by the index the issue is how do you use environmental and social and governance information in a way that can help you engage with the company more effectively exactly and it's it's as you know sort of a key debate and, and there, there are both sort of two sides to, to this debate and the lax of blackrock will of course say that you know well we are you know, we're maybe more tied for a portfolio, but we're active, as you say, within that, within the parameters or the confines of their portfolio. And the others will say, well, you know, actually voting uh, with your feet or uh, buying and selling decisions are, are fundamentally what um, moves the needle. So uh, definitely the, the, both sides of the arguments are interesting, but I would like to, since I alluded that in, in a little bit already to it in the previous question with the Norges example, ask you, uh, whether you're seeing differences in approaches uh, by type of investor. And again, I know that you have some sovereign investors, some insurance companies, pension funds. They generally, all of them generally have a, a long-term horizon. But are there um, some differences or examples that you could give in as to how uh, these different types of investors are perhaps differentiating the importance of the E and the S and the G in their, in their um, investment approaches? Are they of equal importance, or are there some differences in that regard? Oh, I, I think it's it's difficult to generalize, and I'm I'm not sure necessarily putting some uh, group of investors in the sovereign wealth fund category versus a pension fund category is necessarily going to, you know, yield different types of assessments in terms of how they approach what they do. As you said, uh, all, these these I think the long term perspective will be relevant for for pretty much all of these. And, and I think that increasingly, again, the, the momentum is building uh, towards looking at, uh, if, you're, if, if you're raising the ESG question, this, this, is, this is building, um, I think, in, in portfolios and investors around the world, just simply because, firstly, some beneficiaries are looking for that in the, in the funds that they own and hold, but they also, a lot of professional managers who aren't necessarily tied to ESG for the sake of doing something socially good per se, are just recognizing the, these these issues have some commercial impact or some economic value and, and warrant consideration, and I think that that's probably true cutting across all of the you know pretty much all of our ICGN members who tend to be pretty uh, interested in ESG factors and, and I think that this interest is building. Mm. Uh, Amongst sovereign wealth, I mean, you know, we have uh, Norges, as you mentioned, GPIF in Japan, Korea Investment Company Incorporation. The, these are all ICGN members, uh, and they're probably some some of the more active ones within the sovereign wealth fund universe. Uh, I think some sovereign wealth funds may be a bit, um, you know, whether shy is the right word, or, or reluctant to become too visible because sometimes their activities as investors, commercial investors might be, you know, misconstrued or, or associated with some sort of political agenda. So sometimes the sovereign wealth fund will be a bit cautious about cutting too strong a public profile in certain issues, lest it be confused with, you know, political issues or political agenda. But, um, but I think that pretty much all of them are, are if, if the question is directed about how ESG is becoming part of the investment decision, 
I think that this is coming uh, increasingly under focus pretty much around the world. Mm. No, I, I agree with you that that certainly there is a there's a different differences in approaches, notably as you mentioned around um, by sovereign investors in terms of how active they, they want to be, and of course that is also rooted fundamentally in in some of the legacy uh, approaches by international organizations, um, notably the Santiago principles, which were trying to sort of you know lay a, a careful framework for for all uh, sovereign fund investment. Um, Kind of uh, investment at the time that they were written, and I think that it's, it's it would be an interesting space to watch because many um, uh, sovereign funds and you know resource-rich economies have been making investments on the back of cheap valuations, and and I think at least in my personal reading, they are being more active also in terms of governance, maybe in less um, let's call them orthodox ways than some of your members, but it's I think it'll be a, an, an interesting uh, space to to watch going forward. But if I may ask you, sort of in terms of concrete actions, I mean, we, we've seen a number of uh, cases, again, over this year in, in the news, in particular, uh, Procter & Gamble and other companies where investors have uh, engaged quite actively and, and voted against board members or, you know, um, around other, against other shareholder proposals. Could you perhaps give us a flavor of some of the examples of corporates where, in your view, you know, from a perspective of your membership, there has been kind of a maybe a joint effort to uh, to overturn things with respect to again ESG uh, performance and whether some examples where this change has actually been realized. Yeah, um, well, just to say that ICGN itself, uh, we we our engagement is at a regulatory level with, with a, you know with regulatory bodies and standards setters. So we don't we don't engage with companies no, of course. that tell us because we're not investors. But I'll, I'll give you, an, you know, a good example uh, of, of this, which is, again, there's many that one could choose from. Um, but the climate is obviously uh, an important and, and compelling issue pretty much across the board. And, and one of our members, which is uh, the, the pension fund of the Church of England a couple of years ago, uh, began a campaign against the major fossil fuel companies trying to encourage them to manage towards a net zero uh, you know, business by the year 2050, sort of in line with the Paris Accord, um, they and, and they they got other investors to 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 join up with them, and in in the case of BP and Shell, uh, Royal Dutch Shell, uh, they, they were successful. Um, in the case of Exxon, uh, they weren't, and they've divested. So I mean, it, it you know engagement is a mixed bag, and you said at least, and this is this is a, this is an instance in which engagement can ultimately, if it failed, can ultimately lead to an investment decision to, to basically divest. So that's an example. Mm. But and another, just again, just picking one, uh, just using climate as a common theme, and just picking, I was just reading about this the other day. Uh, shareholders resolutions are another way that, that shareholders can engage with companies and just one from this past year in the case of Barclays there were two shareholder resolutions on their uh, 2020 ballot one of which asked the, ba the bank to manage itself uh, in, in, uh, with regard to trying to again similar goal by 2050 I believe to, to be in line with the Paris Accord and uh, the shareholder resolution actually got the support of the bank Board itself, which doesn't always happen, and that that resolution passed by 98%. Uh, a slightly further-reaching solution to even go beyond the Paris Accord uh, that was also on the that same ballot uh, did not pass because the board didn't back it. So, I think the the story is is that their investors are trying to work on these issues with, with tools of engagement, tools of voting, uh, however they can, and, and and also where there's a common issue between investors to try to do this on a joint and, and collective basis. And, you know, sometimes the outcomes are positive. Um, sometimes it, it, it doesn't work as one would have hoped. But I think mm -hmm. that these are these are examples of what, again, there's lots of them. Um, of but just to use a couple of climate examples of the types of things that investors are doing. Now, that's that's interesting because I think the, the examples you gave are, are, are showing sort of dynamics in different different companies, but also different sectors, which is something also I would like to to talk to you about before uh, our time uh, is up today. I think oil and gas is an interesting uh, sector in itself. And it's interesting you mentioned Exxon and some of the um, and some of the resolutions that have have succeeded and, 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 and uh, others have, that have failed. 
because uh, there, there were some interesting commentary by, I think it was Robert Atlas and uh, Colin Meyer uh, about a year ago about the, uh, I remember reading about uh, the, the, the strong chances that they thought that the, the, the Exxon uh, climate resolutions had at the time. And um, we see that not all of them are, are, are um, have been successful. And it's also interesting, for example, I, I, again, just to, to pick a few other examples on the climate uh, um, angle, since you've been mentioning it, uh, I'm not sure if you saw um, last week, there was a, a letter published also by Robert Eccles, which was kind of an open letter to uh, Bill Gates uh, about uh, investments and his uh, possibility to influence the climate uh, disclosure of Berkshire Hathaway. Um, you know, so a lot of um, on the investor side, but also I think from a professional side, you know, there's a lot of voices that are calling companies to, to change uh, practices in, in a number of respects. And oil and gas sector is obviously one that, that um, um, is, 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 a, is a focus, uh, one of the focus areas. But, it, but another sector um, that we, you know, I think we're both following and that has been getting a lot of attention is of course, big tech on both sides of the Atlantic. You know, from, I've been write, writing about this quite a bit. Uh, from a governance angle, but of course, you know, if we look at the the coverage of big tech, it's mostly been from uh, an antitrust angle, uh, tax angle, um, also in, in here in Europe. Um, and I know that the ACGN has has recently, you know, published a viewpoint on this. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, you were um, the pen, or if not one of the pens behind that one. Could you tell us a little bit more about what? Um, Let's let's say what's what is the beef that the ICGN would like to uh, to pick with the with the tech uh, sector governance? Well, it, it's such an important sector, and and I think and this is the first time, at least to to my recollection, ICGN has done something thematic on a particular sector, and we looked at this with a few angles, which I'll be talking about. But but why the tech sector? Well, it's firstly it's 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 important. It's shaping people's lives, whether they realize it or not. It's huge and growing. Um, you know, a, a small factoid is that you talk about what people call the big five of Apple, Google, Facebook, Microsoft, Apple, and if you throw on Tesla on top of that, that's uh, that, that's roughly 25% in the value, at least my, according to my last statistics of the S and P 500. So this is so there's such a huge and enormous and this this is this growth has been you know in, in the COVID environment where a lot of companies were under severe stress um, these these companies had their value collectively increased by about forty percent so it, they're they're big they're growing and you know and they're a source of many positive things in terms of you know helping people's lives in ways that you know how we would we wouldn't be able to to have survived COVID as we have if we didn't have technology. So there's many great things that technology brings us, but I think part of the problem is that there are some significant challenges too. And so I think the, you know, as an investor body, uh, we certainly want to encourage the positive successes of the tech, tech sector, but also we need to raise awareness of some of the potential concerns that investors as well as just the general mm -hmm. public have, because ultimately these are all interlinked. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and what are the key sort of the, the key issues that you would like? Well, I mean, I, I've read the note, but I think it's interesting to, to if you could say a few words about the key issues that you've raised in, in that note. Well, we sort of I mean, just to, there's lots of them, uh, but but to put some of them in, into three sort of tidy buckets, one would be uh, an economic problem, which re relates to the concentration of power and the potential both for economies of scale and economies of scope, particularly the, the, the big tech companies that just um, almost, uh, there's uh, the, 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 their own size is a virtue in terms of creating competitive barriers for people to, to effectively try to compete against them. And this, this may ultimately be a market failure question and it's the type of issue that, that is certainly inviting regulatory scrutiny to the extent that the sector needs to be regulated or potentially even broken up in some shape or form. But this, this, this uh, economic concentration of power, but also just a market concentration of power, particularly in the big tech firms, which has potentially an effect of crowding out smaller competitors and, and enhancing the, the power uh, in a few very large companies. So that's the economic problem. Um, 
a related uh, social problem exists in the sense that uh, what are the impact of technology? There's many positive impacts, but there's some dangers as well in terms of the impact of, of, its, of users of technology, which are all of us. Uh, there's certainly the privacy issues and, and uh, with, they, they say in, in the space, if you, if you don't pay for the service as a user of technology, you are the product yourself because you're effectively giving your data and information about yourself, wittingly or unwittingly, to um, to these companies that can use this uh, in ways that can be applied to algorithms, which might help um, reinforce behaviors or distort yeah. behaviors or all sorts of potentially perverse social consequences, which ultimately is an invasion of privacy. And, and you know, I think maybe even you know having other pretty profound impacts on. Uh, on individual lives. And so that's, that's one issue. Uh, and then I guess the third uh, sort of group will be the governance issue. Again, we said economic problem, social problem, governance problem. The two pieces there, which I would highlight would be firstly the, the need for the sector to think of itself as not just a technology company. These are not just technology companies, but they, they're much broader than that. And they need to understand and govern the sustainability issues that, that they're confronting, particularly the impacts on their stakeholders and, and particularly the users of, of tech companies and, and ensuring that there's an appropriate sensitivity towards, towards uh, customers and, and these any potential distortions um, are uh, overseen and hopefully uh, controlled by board and executive management to make sure that, that uh, the company isn't acting in a distorted way with regard to any of its stakeholders. Uh, and then finally, there's the issue of, of ownership structure. This doesn't affect all of these companies, uh, but many of them has become a bit of a fad in the tech world to, to, to go public, to have uh, some form of dual class shares under the premise of protecting the company from the short term animal spirits of the, of the financial markets so that it can grow. And for some companies, this is just a bit of a norm, whether, that's, uh, whether that should be a norm or not is, is a subject of, of sharp debate. But uh, most in institutional investors uh, think that dual class shares are not a good idea and ultimately lead to poor governance and, uh, and are not good for the company in the long run itself. So to the extent that this is a feature of some of the leading uh, big tech companies, in some, if, you know, again, the economic problem was partly the concentration of power. If you have a dual class share, this even this reinforces that even further by just limiting the extent to which um, the company can have, you know, serious accountability to its shareholders if, if the shareholders voting power is somehow artificially constrained by dual class shares. So it's a bit of a, it can be a bit of a perfect storm. And so these are the issues that we're that we wanted to flag. And we, we wrote a, a, a viewpoint report on this, which uh, I think hopefully you've read and hopefully others will have a chance if they look at ICGN's website. And we have also had some webinars and I think that this is gonna be, you know, one sector we're gonna be continuing to uh, explore very closely. Yes, I think I think from, from our perspective, it's also a sector that I've been looking at closely and writing quite a bit about um, again, looking at, I mean, you've sort of outlined different problems and, and you put governance as, as a, if I, if I understood you correctly, as pro potentially a problem, uh, which it is, uh, I, I agree with you, but I think it's also perhaps potentially also a solution to some of these economic and social problems that, yeah. uh, that, you, that you allude to. Uh, and I wonder also, um, to what extent we need to look at tech companies as a sort of a different animal, you know, as, and I've, I've talked about this in previous uh, conversations on, on this program, you know, we know that banks, for example, are regulated from a governance perspective, from a capital adequacy perspective, from many other angles in different ways than if you're, you know, um, a shoe manufacturer. So I, I wonder, you know, to what extent are we living in a world where tech is now, uh, by virtue of its size, but virtue of its uh, impact on, on cognitive processes and on whatnot, uh, merits to be looked at uh, from, at, at least from our angle, from a governance angle, through a slightly different lens. You know, when we look at state-owned enterprises, for example, the ones that have um, certain social obligations um, they are treated somewhat differently. Um, and of course, it's a different ownership dilemma. I mean, in the sense that they're not state companies, they're 
privately owned companies with their own, as you point out, complicated ownership structures and dual class shares. But but I wonder if there is a, um, a broader need for, for real rethinking about the governance of, of big tech. And um, perhaps that's something we can uh, discuss on, on, on the next episode of, of this program. Thank you so much, uh, George, for, for joining us. And um, Really appreciate your time. And for those of you who are tuning in for this program for the first time, uh, please do feel free to subscribe uh, on the button at the, at the lower part of the screen uh, and to uh, take part in our conversations to suggest topics and engage with us um, on an ongoing basis. Thank you for your time. Mm -hmm.